Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Coalition for Marriage. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, this is our YouTube channel where we talk about what we believe, which is that marriage is between one man and one woman. Not to say that other things don't take place in a liberal democracy. Of course, they do. And they're all around us. But we believe that the relationship that one man has, the monogamous relationship for life with one woman, is unique, it's special, the benefits and advantages it brings to society aren't matched by anything else. And that's not just a dogmatic belief, it's supported by all the body of international social science, uh, which uh, champions marriage as the gold standard for relationships. Something strange has been happening around marriage in the Church of England, a place where you might not think something strange would be happening. It's a privilege to have with us today uh, the Reverend Dr. Ian Paul to brief us on what's been going on and what we should think and do about it. Uh, Ian, would you like to say hello to our listeners? Uh, hi, yes. Very nice to join you here. Thank you very much for inviting me, Tony. Well, it's a real privilege to talk to you. Um, Ian, some people listening in today, believe it or not, won't understand what Synod is. So could you take just a moment explaining what it is and what it means and what your part in it is? Yes, I can. I mean, it goes back to 1919 when um, there was a bit of a crisis about establishment. And for various reasons, people were unhappy about Parliament directly governing the Church of England. And so in the Act of 1919, uh, it led to this, the setting up of the Church Assembly. And what it did is it created a second legislature. So the House of Parliament make legislation, but actually the General Synod also does that. The General Synod was the successor to the Church Assembly. It came into being in the 1970s. And because we're the Church established by law, canon law of the Church of England is actually also law of the land. And it actually goes through. It's agreed by Synod. We have legal advisors. And it goes through what's called the Ecclesiastical Committee and is signed off by Parliament. Um, so it's really it's a reflection of two things. It's a reflection of the autonomy of the Church of England, but it's also a reflection of the fact that the church is embedded in the legal structures of the country as well. And uh, you, um, there are, the Synod itself has three so-called houses. I mean, we don't sit in different houses, we source it together. Mm-hmm. So you have the House of Bishops, which comprises the diocesan bishops plus some elected suffragans. You have the House of Clergy, and they are elected by the clergy of their diocese. And you have the House of Laity, and they are they are elected from the uh, deanery synods, uh, by the lay members of deanery synods across diocese in England. Great, that makes sense. Uh, and your role on synod? I'm uh, a member of the House of Clergy because I'm ordained. Um, mm. I'm also then within synod. You have different committees and subcommittees, and you have different representation as well. So I've I've been elected by the general by the clergy of the general synod to the Archbishop's Council. Mm. so which is the sort of executive committee of the central function of the church i'm also part of what's called the audit committee so that's actually a group responsible for making sure that decisions are made by the archbishop's council in the right kind of way and then uh, there are time from time to time um, there are different groups and committees as well which i might be part of so essentially as i understand it the law of the land as you've 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 well put it says that uh, church of england uh, clergy are not allowed by law to to conduct same sex marriages uh, or so called correct, marriages. yes, and the reason for uh, that is the doctrine of the church. And the doctrine of the church of England is actually quite clear and unambiguous, which is that marriage is between one man and mm-hmm. one woman, and also as part mm-hmm. of that teaching, that sexual that, that's the only appropriate place for sexual intimacy. And the bishops have repeated that on a number of occasions in different documents. Yeah. Yep. So what happened last week then? What what's all the controversy about? Well, the controversy really goes back to conversations we've been having since 2017, but also before that. Um, we had a period in the pre the synods run for five years at a time. It's called a quinquennium. You always say things in Latin to make them sound really important. <laughs> so in the previous quinquennium, previous but one quinquennium, actually, we had this thing called shared conversations because it was very clear that there was no real consensus between different views about whether or not the doctrine of the church should change. At the end of that period, the, the bishops brought a report to synod in 2017 saying basically nothing is changing, and, and, and but we're going to do some teaching. Um the Synod uh, decided by a very narrow margin in the clergy not to receive that report, not to take note of it. And that was a real signal that there was still unhappiness with the situation. As a result of that, Justin Welby said, oh, we need a radical new Christian inclusion rooted in scripture and the Christian tradition, which was itself a problematic phrase. But that then led to this project called Living in Love and Faith, which was a, a, a discussions mm-hmm a book, resources, various meetings. And that process came to an end in 2022. Uh, The end was delayed because of COVID and and, and everything associated with that. And what was then supposed to happen is that the the House of Bishops, 
plus the College of Bishops. That includes all the other suffragan bishops as well. We're supposed to have a series of meetings in the autumn that was disrupted mm-hmm. by the Queen's death. But they were they were expected to bring a proposal, a fresh proposal to Synod in February. What's happened, unfortunately, is because of the lack of time, it's all become very rushed. And what they, um, well, I think it wouldn't be unkind to say, well, it might be unkind, but it's true. What they brought to us as a dog's dinner. And the dog's dinner consisted of, on the one hand, saying that there is no appetite for changing the doctrine of marriage. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, they brought to, uh, a proposal for what they call prayers of love and faith, which apparently might be able to be used to offer some sort of blessing to people who are in some kind of same-sex relationship. But the problem has been that that it's been extremely unclear. It's not it's not at all clear how they can reconcile the tensions between those mm-hmm. two positions, and they've offered no proper legal and theological rationale for what they're doing. Well, that's really interesting. So some of the arguments, are, they, are these arguments, Ian, based on misinterpretations of Scripture or ignoring Scripture? Uh, Tony, if I knew it was as clear as that, um, no. <laughs> they, they, they've lent on some legal advice, which we were, we were given a note of it uh, to Synod, suggesting that there is a difference between holy matrimony, as the church understands it, and civil marriage, as the state understands it. And, and they're really leaning into that. that it, it, their proposals really depend on that differentiation. The, the problem is that no one believes in that differentiation. The bishops haven't in mm. the past. In mm. fact, they've specifically said in previous responses to the introduction of civil partnership initially in 2005 and then civil and then same sex marriage. Both times, the bishops have actually, the House of Bishops have stated very clearly there is no difference between those two things. There are, there are mm. two understandings of the same institution. So there's the church's understanding and the state's understanding, but there, is, there aren't two institutions here. Um, and they've also suggested that it's possible to invite God to bless something without pronouncing God's blessing on it, and that it and that it and that it's possible to bless people in a situation mm. without necessarily blessing the situation or relationship that they're in. Now, none of those three things sound at all convincing to I think anybody listening. So, uh, and and because it's all been rushed, they've actually failed to offer any theological rationale or explanation for what they're doing or why they are now doing something which appears to contradict what they've said before. So at one level, everything is simply up in the air. I mean, uh, p- people have talked about, well, I've talked about the idea that we're, we, we now have Schrodinger's Church of England because, you know, until we mm. open the box, we're not quite sure which way we're going. So the bishops have managed to upset almost everybody. They've not actually made clear why they're doing what they're doing, nor have they actually demonstrated that it's actually going to be possible. So when we come to July Synod, it might be that the whole thing is collapses. But I, it just it's just impossible to say at the moment. It's all very confusing, and I think it's all pretty unhelpful, actually. So at the moment, it seems to be what they're trying to say is that the church can bless sex in a homosexual relationship outside of marriage, as the church would see it, but not for heterosexuals? Or, or, or is this a step on the road to A, accepting same-sex marriage as the church would say it, and B, even blessing heterosexuals who are having sex outside of marriage? Well, um, the problem is they've denied that they're saying anything. <laughs> so okay. when, <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> when, when, when mm. on um, Radio 4, week before last, um, Sarah Malley was asked, are you blessing a sexual relationship? She, she paused and said, the prayers are silent on the question of whether this relationship is sexual. And, and uh, the, the interviewer just sort of went, uh, 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 oh, oh, right. I mean, the, the, the interviewer was completely flummoxed by that response. I mean, mm. so, so in the, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that everybody said at the end of the NLF process was to say to the bishops, whatever you do, please be clear, make a mm. clear and unambiguous mm. statement. Mm. And that's precisely what they haven't done. And, and the other thing which, um, uh, again, campaigners have, 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 have asked for is to say we don't want a policy of don't ask, don't tell, because in the end that leads yep. to dishonesty yep. and ambiguity. Mm. But mm. but Sarah Mullally appears, the Bishop of London appears to be saying that's precisely what they are doing. They're saying, well, we're, we're simply we're going to bless these people. We're not going to ask any mm. questions about their relationship or the situation or anything, but but mm. we're just going to hope that it kind of all works out, which, which, which I don't think anybody thinks is a good way forward. Now, so, campaigners, campaigners for change have claimed very proudly, yes, mm. this is a small concession, but it's a first step on the way to same-sex marriage. But given that mm. the bishops have said we are not changing the doctrine of marriage, I, it's difficult to see why how yeah. that is going to be the case. Yeah. The two things together, that's quite bizarre, isn't it? Yes. But, it is. uh, so, so proponents of a change would say, well, hold on. Um, uh, Jesus talks about mercy and love and acceptance and forgiveness yeah. as much as he talks about anything else. And so really we should put those things at the front and be merciful and loving and accepting to people who actually want to live in same-sex relationships, uh, just as we allow 
people, you know, none of us are sinless perfectionists. So we allow other sinners to be uh, members of the church and to be clergy, et cetera, et cetera. So why not people, even if you accept that it is uh, a biblical sin, which a lot of people don't accept, but even if you do, um, why shouldn't we put love and mercy and acceptance and forgiveness and graciousness ahead of everything else? Well, you can do that, but if you're doing so, you're cherry picking uh, from the teaching of Jesus, because Jesus says quite clearly two two sets of things all the way through the Gospels. You can see this very clearly. On the one hand, Jesus says, "Come to me, all you are heavy, heavy, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, because it's easy." Mm. On the one hand, on the other hand, that's in Matthew eleven. On the other hand, earlier on in Matthew five, he said, Matthew six, Matthew seven, he said. The way is narrow to salvation yeah. and the road yeah. is hard and the gate is narrow and met a few of those who enter the, 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 the way to destruction is, is broad. And um, you just find all the way through the teaching of Jesus, you find that the, the, the mm. free offer of the gift of life on the one hand and the demands of, um, uh, of discipleship on the other. So, you know, when, when Peter recognizes Jesus, you are the Christ, he immediately says, and the Son of Man will be handed over. And if anyone wants to follow me, they must take up their cross and come after me. They must die to themselves. Mm -hmm. So all the way through his teaching, Jesus says, here is the free gift of the offer of life. To receive it, you must repent, change direction, and you must uh, 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 trust trust in me. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 I think the most pointed example is in uh, Luke chapter 5, where you know, people so people are moaning and saying, Jesus is sitting, you're, you're sitting and you're eating with sinners. And he says, yes, I'm, I'm sitting and eating with sinners uh, because um, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm spending time with the sick who need a doctor. Well, the doctor spends time with the sick in order to heal them. Jesus spends time with us as sinners in order that mm. we might mm. repent and change mm. and we might mm. live a new life. Um, I, when I was a teenager, I remember reading a little Andrew, uh, David Watson booklet, uh, which says live a new life. So Jesus' invitation to all of us but not 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 just on sexuality and not just on this particular aspect mm. of sexuality, but on, on, on all issues. He says, um, you're living in a certain way, but that's the way of death. But here is the way of life. And you need to turn and you need to change. Um, yeah. It was Thomas Aquinas who said that to love is to will the best for a person. And mm. and so actually, if we are genuinely going to love those of us, uh, the others in our culture outside the church, then what we need to do is we need to invite them to follow be God's best pattern for their lives. And Jesus is mm. absolutely clear and consistent, as all the scriptures are, that in relation to sexuality, we don't define ourselves by our sexuality. We de we're defined by being male and female created together in the image of God. Mm. And uh, Jesus calls us to this healthy pattern of living and sexuality, which is that, which is either marriage between one man and one woman, a lifelong union, or... Yep um celibate singleness which is the pattern of life that jesus himself lived and paul lived and jesus called this fullness of life it's not a, it's mm. not a recipe for loneliness because he calls us into fellowship with himself and with one another and we come at it so we come at it uh, our supporters come from all faiths and none uh, mm. i would probably say there's a significant number of christians but we certainly have and i interact regularly with with atheists and people yeah. from other religions. Yeah. So we approach it from a secular evidence base. And like you say, the evidence mm. is pretty clear for individuals mm, and for society, yeah. heterosexual uh, monogamous relationships, long-term relationships, i.e. marriage is best for everyone. It's best for the adults, it's best for the kids, it's yeah. best for society. Not only that, but other things are from a research perspective, from an evidence perspective, actively bad in many ways. That's why we advocate for, for marriage between a man and a woman and for its values. But having said that, the argument that Jesus never spoke about um, homosexual marriage, gay marriage, if you like, uh, again, doesn't make a lot of sense because the Bible is one book, isn't it? And it's one yeah. story. And God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, when you take them collectively, uh, yeah. well, actually, and indeed, he did speak about it in Matthew 5, as you mentioned, Matthew 19. He's very clear on what marriage is. Yes, he and is. So and, you can you yeah. can assume anything else isn't marriage. No, in and in case. fact, um, we also need to read it very carefully in its first century Jewish context, because um, for Jews, uh, or actually all the way through the history of Scripture, the the, the Jewish the teaching, the teaching of the Scriptures of, of the Torah, mm. was quite mm. distinctive from um, different cultures in the ancient Near East. And in the first mm. century, um, rejection of all same-sex sexual relationships of any kind, and there was a whole there was a whole raft of different kinds of relationship and, and a wide variety of views in first century uh, pagan culture. But Jewish rejection of same-sex sexual relationships was actually one of the main distinctives in terms of Jewish, Jewish ethics. And Jesus yeah. sits 
exactly within that and then the early jesus movement actually picked that up and followed that that jewish ethic but of course for jesus he did warn against the dangers repeatedly against the dangers of of the greek term is porneia from we get word pornography yep. now for any jew in the first century that word porneia would have included all the prohibited sexual relationships yep. listed in in leviticus which would include adultery it would include premarital sex yeah. Um, it it included the, the normal Roman practice of, of making use of prostitutes, but it would also have included same-sex sex. So Jesus doesn't doesn't say nothing about this. He does say marriages between one man and one woman, and he also he also calls people away from porneia, from sexual immorality, uh, and, invi mm. and invites us mm. to repentance. And the other thing I think is really interesting on the on the virtues of of um, this teaching is that, um, and Rodney Stark is one of the people who's traced how significant. This distinctive Christian ethic was in the early church because that emphasis on um, on marriage as the place for sexual relationships it reigned in male desire quite mm. counterculturally in the first century. It also protected women. It also led to the nurture of children. Actually, Rodney Stark says you can measure the fact that the way that actually part of the reason for the growth of the Christian movement in the first few centuries was that as a result of these things, fewer women died and more children were born so there was actually a, a, a biological growth but it does it does indicate that you can even see historically how that commitment to that that distinctive judeo-christian ethic of marriage mm. actually had a very significant impact on the growth of the early church yeah absolutely right and the other thing if you take the argument well jesus never mentioned that therefore it must be okay well that opens the door to a lot of other stuff uh, we well, did. Know, he, didn't, he didn't ever mention prohibitions on incest, for example. Anything like that, you can say. Well, he never and, said it was wrong. Therefore, yeah. And and, and that kind of whole approach is a very odd sort of proof texting approach mm. to the argument. The, mm. the, the question is, what is the teaching of the whole of Scripture? How does Jesus sit in that? How then does that? How how has that been received as well through the church? Yeah. And it has been received quite consistently. Um, that I mean, belief in that creational covenant relationship of one man and one woman has been the consensus doctrine of the church yeah. Catholic yeah. around the world in every tradition, in every place uh, for the last 2000 years until 20 years ago. So yeah. th there is yeah. a very clear consensus on that. So one last probing question for you then. Um, a lot of people will say, well, so where's my role in the church in that case? So I, for example, I don't see too well. Uh, if I had been living in, in uh, Israel in Old Testament times, I wouldn't have been allowed uh, inside the, the temple because of my eyesight it would have disbarred me uh, and i might say well hold on i'm i'm born that way it's not my fault in mm -hmm. the same way that some people say well look i'm born that way now mm -hmm. there's a lot of research actually to point in a very different direction that it, you know it's not born that way mm -hmm. it's um you know it's it's nurture not nature necessarily mm -hmm. um but how do you then come back to people who say look it's just not fair i feel left out i feel ostracized i don't feel part of the church it doesn't want me um that's not very loving is it uh, the, the church is um, a, a place for sinners to receive forgiveness and healing and to be called to holy living. And and nowhere, nowhere does anybody say, um, oh, sorry, that's my bunny, my dog in the background. There. Yeah. Um, uh, no, no one is, is barred from from joining the people of God by uh, their sexuality or any other aspect of, 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 of who they are. Um, Jesus work, calls and welcomes all of us. And, and mm -hmm. we're all called. Mm -hmm together to um to, to to walk in holiness of life with him and we're all on a journey towards that as well so it isn't a question that at the door you have to tick a box mm. tick a box of holiness to come in we come to receive the grace and the mercy of god mm. and it's mm. really fascinating that scripture never focuses on people's sexuality sexuality in scripture does not define our identity it focuses mm. simply on the life we live and i've got gay friends who are celibate and single and rejoice in that and, and find their place in the family of God. I've also got gay friends who living out of their identity as men have met and married, fall in love with and married a, a women and, and have children with them. So um, it, it, it really is the pattern of life that, that Jesus is calling us to. He's not, he's not mm. asking us to uh, remake our sexuality, but he's asking mm. us to walk the path of holiness with him. And I think the, the, the fundamental fact here is that there is biblically a concept of sin. So some things are, from a biblical perspective, objectively yeah. wrong, yeah. and some things are objectively not wrong. Yeah. And actually, that's defined biblically. Uh, if you don't want to partake in that, that's fine. But if, if you believe that's true, mm. then the idea of being converted, of repenting and turning away from your sins, yeah. well, um, yeah. 
<laughs> but the wonderful yeah, good yeah. news is that we're not left alone. The wonderful good news, you know, that yeah. that Paul in, in Galatians five he contrasts the works of the, of the sinful nature, the flesh, mm. with the life of the spirit that the spirit gives us. And mm. and you know, as Paul says in Romans, it's the letter. The, the, in Corinthians, he says the, the letter of the law brings death, but the spirit brings life. Yeah. And so Absolutely. we're not left alone here. That actually God gives us His spirit in order to form in us as we offer our bodies as living sacrifices by the spirit our minds transformed and he he helps us to walk in holiness of life day by day yeah constant renewal be not conformed but be transformed by the renewing of your mind absolutely right um where do we go from here i know you're a busy man so i don't want to keep you for too long but <laughs> what, what on earth happens well, next we, where is it going from well here? I, we we i'd simply my my approach is to say well i'm going to take the bishops at their word if they say the doctrine of marriage hasn't changed the doctrine of marriage hasn't changed now no, now yeah. let's work that through and see what the implications of that are mm. that that's the issue and that's the challenge so 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 i think for me that the message is uh, stand firm keep the faith Hold the bishops to account and uh, let's honour, let, let's remain as the Church of England, let's remain part of the one holy Catholic Church, which has held this cons consensus view down the down the centuries. Uh, and, and let's live, live it out with integrity. Ian Paul, it's a real privilege and delight to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your time, Tony. Good to be with you.